Hello, I'm Deborah Stein, Professor of the Practice in Engineering and Public Policy, and is Associate Director of the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon University. I'd like to welcome you to this video on risk analysis. This is part of a series of videos on policy analysis and related analytical methods. In this video, Dr. Granger Morgan, Hammerschlag Professor of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon's Engineering Public Policy Department, provides an overview of this analysis method. Much of Dr. Morgan's scholarly work focuses on this topic, and he serves as chair of the Scientific and Technical Council for the International Risk Governance Council. In previous videos, we've spoken about using the 4E criteria, effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and ease of political acceptability to analyze potential policy options. Risk analysis is one way to analyze the effectiveness, and sometimes equity, of different policy proposals. Equity is the degree to which a policy is fair or not fair. Effectiveness is the degree to which a policy is likely to achieve societal goals. After watching this video, you will be able to explain why risk analysis is important, to identify the key elements of a risk analysis, and discuss the differences between a good and poor risk analysis. So Dr. Morgan, thank you for joining us to talk about risk analysis. Um, let's start with an obvious question. What is risk? Well, most dictionaries define risk as exposure to the chance of an injury or loss. And there are two key concepts there. The first is chance. Risk is probabilistic. That is, we don't talk about the risk of things that are certain. Loss is the other important element. We don't talk about things like the risk of, of winning the lottery. Um, now, of course, I suppose if, if you won an enormous lottery jackpot, there could be some downsides to that. But basically, risk involves uncertain events that have negative outcomes. And there's always been risk in life. Virtually everything we do has been uh, uh, risky in some respects. But modern society, in part because we live longer and we have more disposable income, has gotten a whole lot more concerned about uh, risks than perhaps our uh, ancestors once were. And can you give an example of why risk analysis is important to public policy decisions? Sure. I mean, everything we do, as I said, involves some risk. And when we make public choices about engaging in a particular activity, like you know, building a new transportation system, building a new automated runway system for aircraft, there are always risks, and so it's important to do an analysis to make sure that the, uh, the level of risks are appropriate to the activity involved. And so what is uh, risk analysis, and what are its key elements? Well, to answer that question, I have always found it useful to uh, uh, use a diagram, uh, which uh, looks like this. And rather than using the abstract, let's talk concretely about things. Maybe, for example, this human activity is a power plant that's emitting uh, air pollution. And then exposure processes would involve uh, things like uh, modeling the pollution's movement through the air. If, on the other hand, it's something that's a discrete event, like an accident, I could use uh, strategies called fault trees. Then on the next box, uh, effects processes, if I stick with air pollution, that's things like how the air pollution affects uh, uh, my lungs, so maybe I'm uh, more likely to have asthma, but it also affects things like uh, uh, sunsets, which might get redder. Notice that I said redder and not prettier. Uh, and uh, uh, it may also be the case that uh, plants grown in uh, alfalfa, for example, grown in sulfate-poor soil, might uh, grow uh, more successfully. So that's this second set of things that we've called effects processes. And uh, on the slide, uh, I've also plotted an example of an effects process. This is the risk of, uh, the relative risk of getting lung cancer from cigarette smoke as a smoking as a function of how many cigarettes uh, one smokes every day. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, as one smokes more and more cigarettes every day, the, uh, the risk of lung cancer goes up. So this first half, that is the uh, uh, exposure and effects process, is when a risk analyst does an analysis, almost any good analyst you turn to, you'll get very similar results. That's because uh, this is largely a value-free activity. The right-hand side is more value uh, 
based. And so, for example, uh, people look at the environment and, and ask what's happened. Now, you know, if I got asthma, I'll notice that. But if sunsets get redder, uh, I uh, may not have noticed that that was the result of the power plant. And when I get over here to the right-hand box, then I might, you know, value that. I might say sunsets get prettier. The point being that on the left-hand side, I'm trying to leave the value judgments out, whereas on the right-hand side, uh, they're explicitly included. On, on the human perception processes, part of the issue are uh, the way in which our, our minds make judgments in the face of uncertainty. I've listed a couple of so-called heuristics here, that is the mental rules of thumb that we all use subconsciously without thinking about it. Uh, the first one listed as availability says that the chance or the probability that I attach to an event is how easily I can think of previous occasions of that event happening or the ease with which I can imagine it happening. So suppose I was going to drive to the airport right now in the middle of the day. What's the probability I'm going to encounter a state policeman? Well, I've driven that road many, many times this time of day, and so my, the ease with which I can remember how often I encountered a state policeman will probably be pretty well correlated with the uh, uh, judgment I make. On the other hand, I've never driven at 2 a.m., and if you asked me to judge the probability that I would encounter a state policeman if I made the drive at 2 a.m., my uh, the availability with which I can remember examples is not going to be particularly well correlated with the, the probability. And there are other uh, heuristics as well, which we're not going to take time to talk about. In the final right-hand uh, diagram, I value the things that I've observed. And so I may do that in terms of a judgments about willingness to pay. Uh, another issue that occurs in many risk analysis is this idea of the value of a statistical life. Now, nobody's putting a dollar value on lives in the sense of you know, how much money uh, is my life worth. But what we do all the time is judge how much more should we spend at an intersection, for example, to improve the safety or in an airport runway system to improve the safety for very low probability events. That is, the chance may be one in a hundred thousand or something of a death. And at that level, then how much am I prepared to invest to, to save one additional life? The diagram on the right shows uh, work that some of my colleagues at Harvard have done in which they have asked how much is society spending to preserve or to avoid deaths uh, in a variety of different settings. And you can see that there are some probabilistic situations in which we're spending tens or hundreds or more than hundreds of millions of dollars, whereas others in which we're spending just a few thousand, and indeed some where we actually save money at the same time. And so one of the issues here is that society needs to think a bit about how do we uh, choose an appropriate level of investment. The reason that this spread is so wide, of course, is that we never sit down and look at all the risks together. We sort of make decisions about risk uh, one at a time, and so we end up with some that are highly salient, where we end up spending perhaps more than we should, and then others that are very common that we uh, simply don't spend enough on. And what makes uh, people consider something to be risky? Well, it turns out there's quite a lot of evidence that people care about things other than just the number of deaths and injuries that a risk causes. We obviously care about that. But in terms of judging whether something is risky, we also think about whether it's voluntary or involuntary, whether we have control over it or don't, whether it's new or old, whether it's chronic or catastrophic. There's a whole list of things like this. And there's a strong experimental literature which shows that if you ask somebody how risky something is, all those factors matter. On the other hand, if you ask people how many deaths or injuries occur from this particular risk, they do a pretty good job of judging that, but they roughly know the, the number of deaths. And that is not quite the same ordering as you get when you ask somebody how risky something is because all these other factors matter. Consider, for example, uh, two risks. One where two dozen people get killed in uh, a dozen different separate traffic accidents all around the country, and a second one in which the championship uh, 
a high school baseball team of the local uh, community high school uh, is off on a field trip and the bus is hit by something and the two dozen players on the bus all die. Clearly most people would view those two as quite different sorts of risks and that's the kind of issue that I'm talking about when I say that uh, people care about more than just the number of deaths and injuries. And what strategies do we have to manage risk? Well, so to go back to that diagram that I used a, a few minutes ago, we can do a variety of things. We can modify uh, the human activity. So for example, to use my uh, case of a power plant, I could produce power with less emissions or maybe even no emissions if I use wind or solar. I can modify exposure processes. So for example, in the case of uh, nuclear power, public health officials often uh, uh, develop a a supply of iodine pills so that if there were ever an accident uh, they could give people near the plant uh, iodine to fill up the thyroid with uh, iodine so it couldn't absorb radioactive iodine. That, that's a way to modify the effects process. And then it's probably not the way we would want to approach risk issues but a lot of folks do try to modify uh, human perceptions and values and certainly industry all the time is advertising about how safe something is often with the objective of changing our perception and then at the right hand end here uh, benefits and costs I can mitigate or compensate that means things like insurance I mean there may not be anything else I can do but I can at least insure against the event and so to take an example like a fire in my house I can modify exposure processes by uh, uh, making sure that uh, I don't have aluminum wire, for example, that might uh, cause short circuits and start a fire. I can modify effects processes by making sure that uh, uh, I have smoke detectors so that uh, uh, I, if a fire starts, I, I know early on. Uh, and then on the right hand end, I can uh, 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 have fire insurance so that if all else fails, I at least get compensated. And what's the difference between a good risk analysis and a poor one? Well, I said at the outset, risk depends on uh, uh, uncertainty. And so if I haven't done an adequate job of characterizing and dealing with uncertainty in a risk analysis, uh, that's not going to be a very uh, good piece of analysis. I also need to worry about how I draw the boundaries around the analysis that I do. That is, that I include everything that really matters. And I mentioned briefly that human perceptions are really important. And so if I do just a, a narrow engineering or technical analysis and I leave out the human dimensions, that's probably also not going to be a very valuable uh, uh, piece of analysis. Now one good way to learn more about uh, these issues is uh, with a little book uh, edited by uh, Theodore Glickman and Michael Goff. This was done through RFF, Resources for the Future. Uh, actually, the first couple of articles in here are, are overview articles that I've written, and then there's a whole series of other articles that talk about different aspects of risk analysis. Can you summarize the key points of, of what you've told us today? Sure. Uh, risk involves uncertainty, and it also involves loss. We don't call things that are certain a risk, and we don't call th things that are beneficial a risk. And people care about a variety of different characteristics, not just expected numbers of deaths or injuries uh, when they decide how risky something is. There are a bunch of formal tools for, for analyzing risk, um, and they can be used to assess uh, and choose among different uh, technologies or strategies. And it's easy to get fixated on risk. That is, there's a lot of stuff in our lives, and while we ought to be paying attention to the things that are big risks like smoking or uh, uh, bad diet or motor vehicle accidents. It's really easy to get fixated on things that are very, very low probability risks and spend much too much time in worrying about them and not spend enough time thinking about the things that might actually cause harm to you or me or our families. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Morgan, for joining us today and telling us all about risk analysis. Thank you for watching, and I encourage you to watch the other videos in this series.